thank you very much for the invitation and for the uh, opportunity to share some uh, thoughts with you on this topic of hard hardwire marketing. Let me say that uh, what I'm going to talk a bit about is, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit more about what I do and then we'll get right into this. So uh, I, I work in marketing strategy uh, and as Williams very, very nicely pointed out, some of the work I've done. Uh, but I've been looking at lately two big questions. One is how do companies transform themselves to become more customer focused? And that's a project I have a book actually coming out in, in, in February looking at seven companies going through this transformation. And the other project I'd like to share with you today is one looking at how is the concept of being customer focused changing? How is the role of marketing within the organization changing? We're very well aware of how uh, the digital revolution has changed, how we reach customers, how we engage with them, uh, and, and, and th that's all extraordinarily important. But some of the impact it's having is in ter terms of producing the kinds of results that uh, we're here to focus on has changed the role of marketing tremendously. So that's what I'd like, like to do and share with you. So this is work that's uh, been ongoing for the last couple of years. And in that time, we spent a uh, 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 tremendous amount of time interviewing uh, uh, senior executives, both in marketing but also outside of marketing, HR, CEOs, and looking at how the role of marketing is shifting in the organization. And what I'd like to do is, is just share with you two stories, and these are not necessarily the people we interviewed, but these are stories which capture the essence of what we're talking about and hopefully will give you a sense of the, of the changing role of marketing within the organization and how you can create that, that lightning in the bottle through engaging the organization. So one of the companies I'd like to, to, to uh, and these are, these are quotations, by the way, these are things which are, are not confidential, so I'm sh using these to illustrate uh, the points which we, we observed across a lot of companies. So the f the, one of the companies I'd like to talk with you about is General Electric, which is a fantastic, fantastic organization. But marketing uh, not always been the most important role, but also I think uh, where they started about 10 years ago was a pretty traditional uh, organization created or organized around functions, highly centralized in headquarters in Connecticut. The quotation here is, you know, power and P&L responsibility were concentrated in, in the developed world, mostly in the U.S. The major business functions, including R&D, manufacturing, and marketing, were centralized at, at headquarters. And that's a, actually a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, in, other, in other work, the, the, the current CMO reflecting on, uh, back on the role of marketing said, uh, in discussions about corporate strategy, marketing wasn't at the table. At best, it was considered a support function, at worst, overhead. And the CEO had a, a more frank and less flattering view of marketing. He said, marketing, this is Jeff Immelt, the current CEO, uh, said this in public, marketing was the place where washed up salespeople went, he said. So this is not, a, not an encouraging quotation. But if things have changed. So Jeff Immelt becomes the CEO. Uh, what, does he, what does he do? He uh, has to grow. The company has to grow, of course. Uh, he's following Jack Welch, who's one of the most famous CEOs in history. And so he looked at this and said, we're gonna grow by organic growth. Uh, and so the challenge is in the post 9-11 world uh, that it the market would be more global, be more driven by innovation, and a premium would be placed on companies that generate their own growth. So this is, this is his plan to leave, create the legacy, at his legacy at GE. So one of his uh, business heads in India, India's exciting growth market, exactly what he has in mind, uh, Venki Raja proposed a new technology to, to deal with, uh, uh, to create a new, I'm sorry, to, to to uh, identify new opportunity for low-cost X-ray, had a big market in, in India. Developed a proposal, submitted it to uh, the folks at uh, Connecticut, waited for their approval. Now, um, this was not an easy process. First of all, his role, they, said, they reminded him his role was not to develop new products. His role was not R&D or new product development. His role was essentially to sell what was developed in the U.S. and modify, offer suggestions for modification and, uh, and uh, that was the extent of his role. And he, his principal goal was to make the numbers. The second, uh, once he overcame that problem, said I have a great opportunity, he got some, getting some time with the right people was tough, but he talked to the head of R&D. How, how excited do you think the head of R&D was about investing in this new low cost, low cost technology? Not too excited. How about the finance people? What question did they ask? What's the margin gonna be? Well, he said, well, the price is gonna be 15% of the price we can charge in other countries. It's, it's, it's very excited. And then he asked, and then uh, what, what the marketing people had to say, however, marketing people said, what's this going to do to our brand equity? If you're pricing it so low, how is this going to change how people think about GE in India? So the proposal was not funded. 
This happened not once, but many times in different occasions. And eventually they came to this realization that uh, they have a problem. We don't know how to, we don't know how to translate. The, organiza the organization did not know how to translate the, what customers, the opportunity knew about customers into the next growth idea. Now this is a huge problem. Remember what Mr. Himmeltz just said is that organic growth is gonna be the way the cor corporation uh, uh, succeeds. So this took take a, take a process of a few years, but they decided to change things. In 2002, they appointed A.G. Laffley, Jeff Himmelt uh, uh, recruited A.G. Laffley to be on the board of directors at General Electric. They also appointed a chief marketing officer, Beth Comstock, the same year or a year afterward. Uh, and then Jeff Immelt took a central role himself, creating a thing called a commercial council. They hired over 1,000 marketing people for their different businesses and created the se a senior group uh, that included Beth Comstock, and, and, but chaired by Jeff Immelt to develop new growth plans for, for their businesses with these new marketing people. So the role was changing tremendously. And the outcome of that, of that group was a commercial uh, uh, plan they call Execute for Growth. Now why I sh show this to you is that it's very important, I think, to, to, to notice that if you read carefully through here, customers are, are almost everywhere in this chart. It's very, at the very top, 12 o'clock on the clock, is that it says customers use process excellence to satisfy customers and drive growth. Um, uh, commercial excellence at the bottom, develop world-class sales and marketing talent and demonstrate the value of one GE. So what they discovered is that the way to grow is to take this customer perspective and infuse it in key aspects of this process. And the process also, it's very interesting to me, is not a linear, systematic uh, process. It's an, it's an iterative, organic process that reflects customers in almost, in almost every, every stage of this. And, and uh, back to India, what happened, in, what happened in India? Well, they went back and looked at India, great business, and they discovered the customers are very different, and they thought first it was just about low price. It's not about low price, not just about low price. A very important part of this is also about portability. In India, uh, it's, it's more common, or more common than, in, let's say, in the US, for the doctor to come to the patient than vice versa. This puts a premium on portability, and so they developed a whole set of products, different, different price points, different usage, and which functionality is less important, but again, they, but they did hit the 15% target. So let me show you just one ad uh, that summarizes a little bit of what they've done and the impact of this transformation in just six or eight years. electrocardiogram technology from GE. Small enough to fit in a backpack. Very good. <laughs> Powerful enough to bring modern healthcare to places like rural India. So rather than uh, be frustrated by the organization, they've created a process that facilitates this and generates this growth. And in the process, the question is, what's happened to the role of marketing? Well, Beth Comstock's role has changed tremendously. Think back to what Mr. Immelt said at the beginning of this process, where marketing's where washed up salespeople went. Now what they say about Beth Comstock is that she, uh, she's a CMO, uh, leads growth and marketing in, in, in initiatives, as well as the sales and marketing communications function. So she is essentially in, in, uh, responsible for growth and innovation at General Electric, in addition to doing the, the other role, a tradi more traditional role. So this is one of the things we observed across a lot of these companies, is that some of them, we, I call it the rise of the, uh, Forbes I think captured it well, the rise of the eclectic uh, CEO, where uh, CMO, should say, where the CMO becomes incredibly powerful, marketing becomes elevated as a function, uh, the customer perspective becomes infused in key processes throughout the organization, and, and it's a tremendous transformation in a relatively short period of time for, for marketing. 
Now, the other, other, pers the other perspective we saw was completely the opposite of this. And I'm, we'll have to figure out how to resolve both these differences, but it's illustrated by uh, a fascinating company that I've had a chance to get to know a little bit about, which is the First National Bank of South Africa. Now, South Africa is, uh, this is a very different organization from General Electric. They share some things in common. It's a, it's a very old company. It's the oldest bank in South Africa. Uh, but as you can imagine, there's about 52 million people in South Africa, and about 13 million of them uh, do not bank for various reasons. Mostly incomes are relatively low. You know, the cost of banking for them could be relatively high, given the small amount of transactions. So there's a large market they call the unbanked. Now, these people who don't, have, uh, don't bank, uh, however, still have financial needs. Uh, the three most important ones are they have to manage their daily cash flow. They um, have these very small daily transactions and they need micro loans, typically gotten from relatives. So relatives become the bank, people with more money, typically in, in larger urban areas, uh, and, uh, and they become the, the, serve the banking function. So the question becomes, is this an opportunity uh, for First National Bank of South Africa? Again, started as a very traditional bank in 1838. Well, they observed two things about the population. One is, is they love phones. Uh, it's a very, uh, very digitally connected company, 35 country, 35 million people in South Africa have phones. Uh, on this smartphone act scale you may have heard about, they're number two or three in terms of using these smartphones and, and technology to be very effective. And looking at the cost of banking, they discovered that mobile banking costs about one-eighth as much as traditional branch banking. So the question, so the thought was for the people at FNB, how can we use this idea of people being highly connected and the cost being lower to create an opportunity? And their answer was this concept, what they call e-wallet. This allows um, anybody with, a, with an uh, account at FNB to send money to anyone else who has a mobile phone, valid phone number in South Africa. They don't need to have a bank account. Uh, they get a text message with a, uh, an amount in it and a, and a PIN number. They can then take that PIN number, go to a, a FNB ATM machine, put their phone number in, their PIN number in, and then withdraw their cash. Now what this replaces is very interesting, is people used to physically take money and travel and give it to their relatives. So let me show you how the FNB people explain this uh, to the people in South Africa. I'm Stafford Hector, and I'm going to show you how the e-wallet from FNB can help him some BT Mahamba. DE, here I come. He pays a taxi driver to take money to his gogo because she doesn't have a bank account. I'm going along for the ride. You're going somewhere, but you can't choose. There's no holding back, what do you got to lose? You're on your way, you'll never stay. You're on your way. 14 hours. Msumbiti should use cell phone banking from FNB to send money to his Google instantly. She'll receive an SMS and can draw the money from an FNB ATM without a bank card. Google won't have to wait for money again. E wallet from FNB. Dial star 120 star 321 hash. FNB, how can we help you? So this is begin the beginning of a stream of innovations. My, my personal favorite is this, and it took me a little while to understand this, is the cashless ATM. Now, uh, it sounds very useful. It sounds to me like uh, non-alcoholic scotch or something. It sounds quite useless. Uh, uh, so what is a cashless ATM? Here's the problem they have. Now they discover people like this uh, sending money uh, over the phone. But there's a lot of places where there is no FNB ATM in rural South Africa. So what do you do? With them, well, you could establish uh, ATM machines all over the country, very expensive. Managing the cash is expensive, difficult, and so forth. Uh, but there, this is part of their process of innovation. You can see a theme here in innovation. Uh, they thought, well, you know, if you think about it, in these little villages, there's plenty of cash. It's just not, we don't control it in the ATM machine. So what they create is this cashless ATM. And the way it works is I send you a text. You go to a cashless ATM, which prints out a receipt. Do the same process. Enter your phone number, your PIN number, you get a receipt. You take it to an FNB retailer who's a customer in your village, and they'll give you the cash. So now, instead of them managing the cash, they now have this huge network wherever there's a retailer with F FNB. Exactly. Fantastic idea. So we'll talk about how they, how they develop these ideas in a moment with the role of marketing. 
The other favorite example is they, decided, they discovered, you know, if we could switch our existing customers over to have them bank more digitally, our costs would drop by seven-eighths. This is, this is obviously a huge number. So what do they think about? Well, people love iPads. The telecom companies subsidize your iPhones. Why shouldn't we subsidize iPads? So they start offering people subsidies to switch, if they switch their banking from traditional banking to this, and they can get, a, get an iPad. And they become uh, the largest seller of iPads in South Africa, selling one every minute. While, and people love it while their costs are dropping as fast as they can imagine. Now, how do they do this? How do they come up with these ideas? Do they have a, a chief marketing officer like General Electric? Well, well no. They, they've, they've used a very different process. They engage the organization completely. Now, GE engages the organization, but from the top down, FNB does it from the bottom up. They have what they call an innovator's annual contest. They offer a contest to anyone in the organization to come up with a, with a great innovation that can, can be commercially innovative. The prize is $120,000, which in local terms, in terms of the income, would be around a million uh, Swiss francs compared to the in, in average income here in Switzerland. So this is, this is a big number. Uh, and they encourage people to do that. And those are the, for the big breakthrough ideas. For other ideas, they have the mini-evasion program. That is, things, small ideas that can be, be created in less than three months, like the cashless ATM machine. So what they've done is instead of, instead of uh, centralizing marketing and having uh, the CMO as in the GE model, they've created this diffuse model with innovation champions in every business. So you might ask, what's the role of marketing? Well, marketing plays a very small role, formally plays a very small role in this organization. Um, but the results have been spectacular. Uh, it's part of a larger bank, so everything is not public, but the uh, return on equity, for example, in 2012 was 38.7%. In a country where uh, a third of the people don't bank and where incomes uh, are, are dramatically lower is quite, quite, quite significant. And this, this uh, example, FNB represents, I think, the second type company we observed in this research, which is one that uh, essentially announced the CMO is uh, not relevant, really. So when, one, one day in this research, we had an interesting conversation, my colleagues and I, with two different people from two different companies, both very successful, large uh, global organizations. One of them we said, we asked, what's the role of marketing changing? And they described this process where the CMO has become much more powerful and had played a role in innovation and HR. And in some organizations, I can tell, I can tell you, that we, we even observed that the chief marketing officer is now taking over the chief information officer's role. So we have this merging of, 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 of roles. The other person said to us, marketing is dead in our company. It used to be about promotion, and that's going away with the, with the advent of digital. Marketing is, is dying. So the question we, ha we had to resolve is, is what's going on here? And in the context of this presentation, the question is, what do GE and FNB have in common? What, what are they doing that's similar? And, and uh, what, what is the underlying process that's driving all of these? And I think what's similar in both of these and all these organizations we looked at is that they're becoming much more customer focused. And they're doing it in very different ways. Some are doing it uh, by elevating the marketing function. Some are taking the marketing function and dismantling it and distributing it throughout the organization. At GE, they described it this way. Um, they, it's even changed the way they, this, they train and develop senior leaders. The world is so complex and customers won't tell us exactly what they want. So ML's strategy is to recruit talent with deep customer relationships and expertise to listen to customers and translate that into new technology. This is customer focus. Now, they don't necessarily refer to it, but that's, that's what they're doing. They're taking this and they become extremely customer focused through elevating the CMO. At FNB, it's completely different. Well, it's completely different, but it's completely the same. It's bottom-up engagement in the organization, and the way they described it is we pursue innovation to deepen the relationships with customers, not for the sake of innovation. So they've become customer focused too, but they've done it in an extremely different way. So what, what, are, the, what are these have in common, um, and, and the other question is really, what's driving both of these toward the same goal? What's driving both, and all the organizations we studied, this was a driving force, and there's two, some of which will be things you'll be very familiar with, but I hope to uh, highlight some of the impact on the, on the marketing role. The first role, of course, is digitization. Digitization, as you know, is changing the world, changing marketing, changing so much more, uh, and the stories with it are, are very familiar. 
know, the, uh, Facebook reaching a million, Apple becoming the biggest, uh, most successful company, mergers in the ad world. But I'd like to focus for a minute on the impact on customers and consumers of this. And of course, the smartphone has, plays a big role in this. There's an article from Times describing how the smartphone is changing our life. Um, it says nearly 60% of smartphone owners don't go an hour without checking their phones. 54% check them in bed before going to sleep, after they wake up, and in the middle of the night. That's, uh, I think, interesting. One in five checked immediately after sex. That's also interesting. Uh, and 40% of uh, checked their smartphones on the toilet. So, so we seem obsessed about this, and we have to explore a little bit why this is. In fact, some people argue we're addicted to these phones. Now, this is, this is an academic gets me interested. Why are, we, why are these things so pervasive, and why can we not live without this? So I thought we'd explore this a bit. I'm not done. Uh, we've hired a, a person at Northwestern, a neuroscientist, actually. So I've been discussing this with him. And I have, a, I have something I'd like to share with you about. This thing explains something important uh, and the implications we'll talk about in a moment. And it really goes back to thinking about us um, through an evolutionary lens. So we've evolved, and we have lots of behaviors as a result of evolution, some of which are very useful, others which May not, these behaviors may be less productive than they were originally. But, but if you think back 5,000 years ago, say we were living here in the lovely Zurich, what would become Zurich, um, what's our, what would our lives be like? Well, it'd be tough. The world would be hostile. Uh, we'd spend most of our time figuring out how to, how to survive. And eating, of course, is an important part of that. And reproducing is an important part of that. So we develop biological mechanisms to reward us when we eat. Uh, to store fat because food is hard to come by, and to reproduce. So we're all familiar with those, those incentives, those biological mechanisms. The other two, though, however, that are less obvious but very important for our discussion here and for the modern world is that we're also having uh, biological mechanisms that encourage us to, 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 to explore the world and to learn about it. Uh, if, if there was no mechanism to do this, you, uh, uh, we would die, right? If there's no mechanism to go out and hunt, desire to go out and hunt for food and learn about the world, what to avoid and where to find food, we would, we would, we would simply die. And the mechanism for that is this chemical called dopamine. So it reinforces our learning and it reinforces, it provides a motivation for us to go out and explore the world. Now, unlike the satiation you feel when you're eating fine chocolate or even drinking a fine Bordeaux, eventually there's a limit. Um, we've, we're programmed with dopamine to be, never be satisfied. Why? Because you can never stop searching or learning. Now, what do we learn as a result of this process, living here, say, 5,000 years ago? We learned one thing very importantly, that when, the way to find food is not to do it individually. Why not? Not to venture out into the wilderness alone, Risky. So what do we do? We learn to do things in communities and groups. And we spend most of the day hunting and gathering, come back, and what would we do? Share information. So what did we learn about in, through this process of evolution? We learned that exploring the world is, is essential for survival, but risky. Sharing, learning about the world is very important, and we get this reinforcement every time we do. And sharing information with those people in our community increases our chances of survival. Now, fast forward 5,000 years, what's happened? Food is plentiful. Google, the internet, and the iPhone, among other things, have made exploring the world extremely, extremely easy and risk riskless. And so what do we do? Well, we consume huge amounts of food, creating problems because our biological systems tell us we should store fat. And we get a, a, a little dopamine hit every time we, we surf the web. So what do we do? We become essentially addicted to these devices. So if junk food channels our need for, for calories, the cell phone and the mobile device is the perfect device to channel our basic instinct for, for survival through learning and explore, exploring. Now, why is that important? It's important because two things. It means that we have taken over the control of this information flow. One of the things that's very important is 20 years ago, information slowed, flowed at a relatively slow pace by comparison, and it was controlled by organizations of the world. Today, it's controlled by consumers, which means the speed at which things diffuse is, is remarkably faster. This is, is not, uh, of course, radically new, but and let me just give you one example to illustrate this. It's my favorite example of this. It's this comes from us from South Korea. So you all know this, this person, uh, Park Young Sang, the uh, the uh, uh, no, better known as Psy, who performed Gangnam Style. You all know, you know this? You know, are you familiar with it? Okay. 
So I have a video which uh, I'll show if you, at a break if you like to see. If you haven't seen it already, I highly encourage you to see it. It's this pop, four minute pop video where he, he does this uh, very clever dance. Now, um, uh, po you know, uh, uh, popularizing the lifestyle in his neighborhood in, in Seoul. Now, the reviews of this are interesting. So the Daily Mail says it's a bizarre music sensation. The, Guard the Guardian in the UK calls it a ravey Euro dance with guitars. Uh, the Voice says it's inspired silliness, and my favorite is uh, Boris Johnson, the uh, mayor of London, says it's a cultural masterpiece, which is interesting. So he's an interesting guy. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, but I'd like to put this in some context. So if you think, look at look at the big hits of our, of, of of history in terms of books and music. Uh, what you see is Charles Dickens wrote the best-selling book of all time, which is Tale of Two Cities, excluding the Bible here. The Beatles have sold more musical al albums than anybody else, 220 million since 1960. I should say Dickens sold 200 million copies since 1859 when he published Tale of Two Cities. J.K. Rowling, uh, collectively, all the Harry Potter books have sold 450 million, not, not one of them more than Tale of Two Cities, however. And the question is, what do you think our friend from South Korea has done? In, uh, in his, he, he posted his video in July 2012. So, set 1.7 billion hits. 1.7 billion views in 15 months. Now, what does this reflect? We have these dopamine-fueled consumers, dopamine-fueled technology-enabled consumers, doing these things, watching this, and sharing it. Why? Because we're programmed to do this. And so the speed of things happening is, is, is remarkable. The second big change, of course, is globalization, which we all know, the GE example, South African example. Um, but the best example of this and the most that gives us a window on something more influential is the, is the Arab Spring. Of course, started by one Tunisian individual, uh, affected 10 or 11 countries or 12. Um, the question is, what, why is this important to look at? Well, uh, it's, of course, been fueled in part by this combination of technology and political change. It says, the revolution wasn't televised. Rather, it was tweeted, Facebooked, and YouTubed. The protesters used social media to organize, mobilize, and document the events with such success that Egypt shut down the internet and cell phone networks on J January 27th. So this was a, clearly a, a, the first revolution where technology played the central role. But, but there's a bigger point here, which I need to share with you, which is that this is, a, if you look at the timeline of political change over the last 30 years, since the introduction of the mobile phone around 1973, there's been a really fundamental political shift. And that shift is illustrated here by many of the changes that we're now seeing with, uh, in a very powerful way. But the Chinese reformed the economy in the 70s. Um, the Berlin, when Berlin Wall fell, affecting, of course, the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991, along with India's change in the economy. Brazil got inflation under control in the 70s. Uh, and then the Arab Spring is the most recent of these political changes. But my point is this, is that there's two big forces operating here. One is this clear technological revolution. But the other is this political empowerment. China. Brazil, Soviet Union, India are all a, a shift toward greater reliance on markets, greater choice for consumers, greater political empowerment for consumers. So what we have is this co combination of both political empowerment with technological empowerment, which is, ch which is very vivid in the Arab Spring, but is changing things remarkably and shifting the balance, realigning the world economy. Uh, it's, uh, Couple, you know, we're all familiar with these changes, but some of them are quite striking. The article in the medical from, from the foreign policy describes that in 2040, they predict that the per capita, GD, G, uh, per capita income in, in uh, China will be $85,000. So this huge shift. And I, for me, this is very vivid. You know, we're having challenge in the United States growing. And not only that, if you look at the auto industry, uh, I was talking before with one of uh, the members here, and you know, it, it, Detroit is struggling. The average price of a house in Detroit is $48,000 now and dropping, right? Which is unbelievable, $48,000. Um, and so, there are, by the way, there are houses in India in what, what, what we would describe as slums, which sell for $75,000 today, US dollars. So it's, it's a remarkable realignment of the economy. Uh, and shift from the wealthier countries from the developed world to the less developed world, but also this change reflects a shift from political shift from organizations like governments and corporations to individuals in terms of freedom. And of course, all these people are, are wired, uh, and, and the top 10 uh, countries for mobile phones are, as you see, in, in some of these mostly in the exciting developing markets. 
we certainly, the U.S. is three, uh, Japan is seven, uh, Germany is nine. The rest are in, the, in, this, in, this, in this new world. So what you see is this, what I see is this tremendous power shift, combination of four forces. One is these empower, empowered individuals in two ways, political reform coupled with technological empowerment which produces a, a much more powerful consumer. We are, not only have access to information, but we have access to each other, access to a billion people on Facebook. That's a stunning amount of power. Uh, and I, I'm sure you've all seen examples of places where uh, individuals had a huge impact on organizations through, through, the, through the internet. It, the accelerating competition, because we're so connected with one another and we have this biological urge to learn and share, we share things and, and it's accelerated the rate of competition tremendously. Um, there's disruptive innovation, which is very obvious, and this global shift in, from the developing world to the, de to the de from the developed world to the developing world, from, from organizations to individuals. Now, that's, that's the big change we're familiar with. The question becomes, why is that important? Well, if you think about the way most organizations used to do marketing, here's, here's one way to think about it. Marketing was understanding customers, that fed into strategy development. It was this very logical, sequential process. Now, what happens when you take this process? What sort of world is this process designed for? It's designed for a world where, where the economies are stable, where customers are not very powerful, where uh, you can take your time, uh, where processes are highly structured uh, and, and, and systematic, uh, and where the concentrated, remember at General Electric, where, the, where the, the, the decision making is centralized and concentrated in the developed world. So highly functional, highly specialized, and what's happened? The customer has become too important and too powerful to be isolated to, two fun to these two stages in, in, the, in, the, in, the, organi in the process. And, in, and of course, to be fair, although we put it here in the beginning of market research, there are lots of companies who really didn't, who ignored that and really was marketing played one role in the marketing mix and it was principally advertising. So the shift that, I, that I've seen happening is, is something that I think captured, is better captured by a chart that looks like this, where the customer focus is is infused throughout the organization in different processes. It's not the only thing, it's not the only influence, but it's a central influence, whether it's GE or FNB. So the question becomes, how do we get the customer perspective in each of the core processes in order to, sp to be more responsive to customers, to be faster, to, to operate at lower cost, and to do it in ways that, dis that create disruptive innovation? And so each of these creates a somewhat different uh, changes these roles of these, of these or organizations differently. And at the very top, let's just talk about how it changes leadership. Remember, remember Jeff Emma was the one who said that marketing is where washed up salespeople went. By the way, he was a former salesperson and a marketing person. Uh, but now he says he spends two, uh, let's see, five days, five days a month with customers talking about what GE is doing, what ideas the customers have, and how they can do better. The senior leaders become the champion. We go from being the, the, the functional experts in marketing to being uh, the champion for the consumer throughout the organization. Uh, to, to bridging silos, which you find in these large organizations is they're, they're you know, encumbered by these silos which are reflective of this more hierarchical linear world. And so bridging these silos becomes central, just creating disruptive innovation and think just in general thinking uh, uh, very differently, but also creating this cultural change. Let me point out that one of the jobs Beth Comstock had at General Electric was to change the culture in the organization. Now, for many marketing people, that's not uh, an experience that they have, a, uh, not, a, not a, a task with which they have tremendous experience. So, and, and it means changing the way we think about the values in the organization and changing in, in, in quite fundamental ways. So it changes the way we think about strategy too. Strategy in the old days was understanding consumer behavior, segmenting, targeting, positioning, building great brands, and engaging and, and communicating with customers. Today, it's much more about understanding deeper motivations. What, what is going on in India? What's, what, 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 how do Indians feel about, uh, about chocolate? How do they feel about, about uh, mobile phones, uh, automobiles? What are the sort of deeper, deeper uh, motivations? It's more about global, globalizing. How do we globalize? How does GE go from being centralized to being uh, global. What's the right mix of centralization versus decentralization? Turns out in the case of India, what they did was um, create a separate business unit with a separate uh, 
business head who was, who was a, with his own P&L who reported to a vice chairman at General Electric. So they created an organizational solution, organizational solution for that. There's a greater focus on proactive innovation and highly unstructured, pro highly and unstructured process. I was having dinner with some CMOs not long ago and I asked them, you know, what's the strategy of development process like in your organization now? And one of them said, quite, he goes, quite simply, it's chaos. And what he meant by that is they've gone from a very systematic structured process to they're trying to develop something new. So that's part of the change there. The change in organization and culture is about, um, about this greater customer focus, which requires different values, different ways of thinking, the role, role, different roles for openness, empathy, uh, you know, respect, and it's much more a transparent world. So the values have to change. And, and not everyone, by the way, is well suited for that, and not every organizational structure fits it perfectly. Uh, strategy implementation is changing a lot too. It's gone from being you know, in the marketing world. My colleague Phil Kotler came up, term, uh, came up with the term the four P's, which has become very popular, and of course, and had very influential. But one of the things in talking to people I've discovered is that seems a bit outdated. It's, it suggests that these are four individual activities you coordinate. What, what seems to be much more uh, reflective of the reality is creating systems. Um, that is, isn't, isn't just a product, but it's a system of product and software and expertise. Uh, it's not just pricing anymore. It's, it's what's, the, what's the revenue model that's associated with this system? How do we engage people? It's not just about, of course, communication. And how do we provide access and, and, and availability? So it's much more of an organic system approach. You know, Apple calls it the ecosystem. Other people have different terms for it. But it's a much more holistic system, which presents organizational challenges because the challenge is how do you bridge these different silos in, in, the, in the organization. But it's, it's, it seems to be the wave of the future. And then how do you measure all of this in terms of metrics and analysis? There's, of course, issues with big data, but how do you also get the deeper insights in, in, into understanding the customers? So if you put all this together, it's, it's, a, it's a really a fundamental change of marketing from being an isolated function or a limited function to much more central to almost every aspect of, of the organization. And that's reflected both at this in this one model where, where the function is elevated in the context of GE, or one where it's simply diffused and integrated in the process in the, in the example of, uh, of FMB. So in some sense, it's a fantastic time to be in marketing. These customers who have uh, uh, become increasingly powerful, uh, too powerful to ignore, and too powerful not to integrate into every core function of, of, the, of the organization. And uh, so that's, that, that's the exciting part. So it creates tremendous opportunity. And if you think about it, the, the way I like to think about this is a, a, another article in, in uh, Forbes that captures this quotation, I think captures the essence of what we've observed, is it says here, today, marketing is the business. And that's what's changed. And one of the questions we in, in, inevitably encountered in talking with people when they described the role of marketing in some of these organizations, we said, how is that different from the CEO? And the answer was, in many cases, it was very similar. If you think back to Beth Comstock, she's responsible for driving growth and innovation at General Electric. That's a fairly significant responsibility short of dealing with Wall Street. So I think the, 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 I'd like to just leave you with this thought is that, is that uh, th these changes have been dramatic. We think a lot about, as I say, how digitization and globalization have changed the day-to-day -day tactics in which we reach customers. But the other, I think the, 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 the larger issue is this is changing how we think about marketing more generally and management more generally. You know, Peter Drucker 50 or 60 years ago described marketing as the whole business seen from the point of view of customers. And what happened in the intervening 50 years is we, we ignored that for the most part. And we created this functional view of marketing and that played a role in the organization. What's happening because of these pow powerful customers, globalization, digitization, is that, that that concept is finally becoming more of a reality. And, and for that, that's a very exciting time to be in marketing. And so it's a, there's, a, I think, and this is just the beginning. I think one of the last things I'll say is that one of the things we uh, observed is that, is that uh, when talking about this digitization and globalization, it seems that in the last six or eight years, it's really ha begun to have a huge impact. So if you think about the potential here, uh, it's huge. And so I think the potential and the role, the opportunity to be in marketing at this moment, is a, it's a fantastic opportunity. Fantastic place to, to have, have the insight about the customer and, and realizing this idea that, that the customer really is, everyone's beginning to realize, even in the most skeptical organizations, that the customer is the core and that's the central, uh, central to the success and the future of both creating value and, and innovating. So, thank you very much.